Okay, well, I mean, just um, this is the, the third in um, series about Christian nationalism. And the first one we looked at uh, whether Britain was a Christian nation. Um, and uh, then the second one we looked at the interrelationship between patriarchy and uh, uh, Christianity and looked at the story of Jesus and the Syrophoenician woman. Uh, and this is the third of the three, um, and the title is Jesus and Rome. Um, is Neil? Um, and I, I want I just do a little kind of preliminary introduction to it, and then we we'll look at uh, a text. And the text I thought we should look at is the trial of Jesus uh, before. Pilate in John's Gospel. Um, so we can look and see if we can tease out any, any, uh, uh, anything from that interaction between Jesus and this representative of the Roman state, um, this very direct confrontation, see if we can look at that and see if there's anything we can learn from our own, both from his uh, way of dealing with the, the Roman state, which was predominant at this time. I mean, they were uh, an occupied, Jesus was living in an occupied country, a country that resented the occupation, and Rome was all-powerful. Um, uh, and uh, uh, we talk a lot about empire today, you know, the kind of legacy of colonialism and imperial history that, that is I impacting considerably on uh, the world to, a, exactly as it is today. Um, so let's see if we can learn from how Jesus dealt with, with that. Uh, and I guess empire for us today is both the legacy of empire, which is still impacting, and the, the kind of United States, the hegemony of China now, uh, European Union, these big blocks, which still have such a dominant controlling influence over other parts of the world. Um, and uh, I chose John's Gospel because it seemed to be the sort of least political of, of the four Gospels. It's uh, regarded as being a, a kind of the spiritual Gospel, you know, the one that uh, we, we look at for affirming our spirituality. But it's obviously got a, a strong uh, intention of might call it a Christological intention, an intention to tell us what John, how John understands the person of Jesus and the important you know, who Jesus was, um, the Word made flesh, um, the one who was uh, came to his own and his own received them not, um, is a kind of key uh, text from the from the um, prologue. But even though this is kind of spiritual gospel, there is still a history within it. Um, and uh, you can tease out the real kind of historical events within that. Um, and there clearly were uh, clashes between Jesus and the authorities. Um, I think in chapter six, you know, Jesus has to kind of get out of the way because the people are trying to make him king. Um, and that notion of kingship is, is uh, whether Jesus is you know, aiming to be the king of his Jews is, comes to the fore when you come to the to the last uh, few chapters of the trial and so on and the, and the crucifixion as well. Um, and for the early church, um, uh, that this kind of question was around all the time as to how much you accommodated Rome and you tried to kind of uh, get a kind of um, a, a prashamon a with them. It is just kind of an understanding between between the Roman authorities and to what extent you were in direct opposition to them. And, uh, and, and it fluctuated in different centers um, and it, it definitely uh, went through times of you know, real trial. Uh, and persecution and so on, um, and a lot of the text, because it's it's written in a in, under 
an imperial power, a lot of the text has got rather subtle uh, ways of talking about Rome. Um, so even in Revelation, Rome is not mentioned, but Babylon is, and we, we all know where Babylon is. Um, but I guess the hope was that the, 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 the Roman authorities reading this would not understand where Babylon was and what was meant by that. So some coded language, a lot of coded language, which kind of needs unpacking. And uh, just to give a little bit of background before we read the text, um, uh, John's was obviously writing for a church, for the church. He was telling the story for the church. It was great. Um, he was telling the story for the church. Uh, but I think when you read the, hi Graham, when you read the, the story of the trial and the crucifixion, uh, John seems to assume that people know the story. Um, and he doesn't, doesn't you know, just reiterate the whole of the story, but he's definitely drawing upon the synoptic gospel, the first three gospels. He's, he's drawing upon that story uh, as, as a tradition and then just twi uh, embellishing it or putting nuances within it. Um, and he's writing in what we might call a post-revolution situation. You know, the the, the, the uh, first revolt against Rome takes place in you know, 66, 70 AD. He's writing after that, uh, probably between 80 and 100, somewhere or there. Not, not too, too sure where. It could be um, Antioch or... Um, uh, Ephesus or Alexandria, we don't know quite where, but he was writing somewhere uh, uh, in the Roman Empire, uh, but after the time when the Jews had revolted and the temple had been destroyed and um, and the, the, the Jews were trying to rediscover their identity at, after that revolutionary situation. But the Jews at that time were not pacified. Uh, they were not, you know, all content and, and had accepted, you know, their defeat, um, which happened later. Um, but they, they, um, they kept that messianic expectation alive, you know, which we read in a lot of the apocalyptic literature. And there were rebellions by Jews in the diaspora. Uh, in, in Egypt, in Cyrene, Cyprus, Mesopotamia, in years 115 to 117. And um, another revolt took place, uh, Simeon Bar Kokhba, in 132, 136 uh, CE. So he's not writing in a situation where the Jewish community has just accepted the authority of Rome. There's still a lot of discontent, there's still a lot of unhappiness about the occupation um, and uh, so uh, I'm you know fearful of repression because the repression against Israel in, in, in AD 70 was, was fierce um, so that's that's the kind of background you know we, we just have this sense in which we, John's gospel uh, tends to be thought of as a rather peaceful gospel spiritual lovely uh, and outside of outside of an actual historical context, but it wasn't. It was it was written in in a time when um, the relationship between uh, Israel and Rome was disputed uh, and uh, a source of contention and unhappiness uh, uh, and so on. Okay, that's just just kind of background. Um, so let's. Unless anybody wants to say anything about that. Happy? I mean, yeah, okay. Well, let's, let's just read, read um, the text then. Uh, and then we'll see what we can unpack from this. It's quite long. Uh, yeah, why don't you? Me? Yeah. Alrighty then. 
Uh, it's the John 18, 28 through uh, John 19, 16. Okay. Then, he, then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was so early in the morning. No, it was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Jesus, Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So, you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against them. But you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and the power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on Pilate tried to release him. The Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gebaitha. Now, it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but the emperor. <laughs> then he handed them over to be crucified. So they took Jesus. It's that, it's that line, isn't it? We have no king but the emperor is the one that gives it away. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I mean, that's, that's, that's just an amazing uh, passage. But, mm. Uh, I just just to 
again, as a, a preliminary, uh, what's happened before this in John's Gospel, the first thing that's, a couple of things have happened which aren't in the other Gospels. Um, the first is that in, um, in, in the, the garden, um, in the garden when Jesus is praying, when he's arrested, it says Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with the police from the chief priests and the Pharisees. And they came with lanterns and torches and weapons. So the, uh, this is the only gospel in which the Romans appear in the arrest of Jesus. Um, and in, uh, yeah, and in verse 12 of 8, chapter 18, says, so the soldiers, their officer, and the, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and found him. So the kind of conventional view that the, the, the Gospels were trying to absolve Rome of responsibility for uh, Jesus' death is not really held up in, in John's Gospel. Rome is responsible for, for the death of Jesus and his arrest. And, and the Jewish court, pre, pr prior to this section that we've read, doesn't make any charge against Jesus. They just bring him to Pilate. Um, and there's no torture by the Jewish uh, authorities. It's the Romans who do the torturing. There's no torture by the R Jewish authorities, just a slap. One of the um, uh, police, of the, the Jewish police slaps Jesus at one point. And in verse uh, 22, when they had said this, one of the police standing by near, nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, is that how you answer the high priest? So bring it, this kind of central point of this uh, confrontation with Rome here is, is actually what actually brings Jesus to the point of his death. Any, any first observations? I mean, there are three characters out there in this. There's, there's Jesus, there's the Pilate, and the, the Jews. And uh, we don't really know what he means by the Jews. I mean, we, he, he, he doesn't mean all of the Jews. You know, he, he means um, the opponents of, of Jesus. But it's that, to me, it's just that line, you know, we have no king but the emperor is the one that kind of the one that kind of really gives it away what's um, going on here um, it's, yeah i mean it's, it's sort of always been in, important that um the jews have a king you know but now it's like we don't have a king we have the emperor you know they've completely sold themselves out um to rome completely entirely sold themselves out to rome there's no kind of, there's no kind of, there's, there's no kind of Jewish hope, if I call it that, if you get what I mean. Mm. Um, yeah. oh, okay, that, that is really important because you might see that the whole passage leads up to that. Mm. Um, and... Uh, I just wonder what your, I mean, and the idea, this issue of the king, kingship of Jesus is also absolutely embedded in the story. This is the questioning of, G, of Pilate to Jesus is always about kingship. And he ends up by putting, you know, the sign on the cross, this is the king of the Jews. Um, what do you think of Pilate then? Let, let's start with him. Well, he doesn't. I mean, sorry, can you mute? Thank you. He does, I mean, at least when I was reading it, my, my very kind of first impression, he doesn't have really much idea of what's going on, does he? He's just kind of, he's kind of just another pawn in this giant machine, really. And he's like, I mean, that's how it feels when reading it. I might be, I might be wrong in that, but he just kind of, he's just like, okay. <laughs> um, he, he's kind of. Just another cog in the machine, isn't he? And you know, he gets the he gets the kind of uh, he gets you know told he should kill someone, and he's like, uh, yeah, I don't know. 
Uh, I mean, there are kind of two views, you know, and and, and that we we can explore. I mean, the, one view is that he's is a soft character that basically, and this is this is a very popular view. I mean, and, and maybe very common Christian view. You know that he's really sympathetic to Jesus, thinks Jesus is innocent, uh, but he gives in to the Jews, um, and uh, by indicating that he seemingly implying that he thinks he's innocent but just has to kill him anyway, kind of absolves Rome of uh, responsibility uh, and throws the responsibility onto the Jews. And John's Gospel, you know. Uh, is seen as being part of this sort of narrative, Christian narrative, that the Jews were responsible for the death of Jesus. Um, the other view, which I think would be worth exploring tonight, is that he was actually quite a strong character. He was quite manipulative, and he had a very clear intent in, in this. Um, I mean, let's just begin in that first paragraph there uh, and verse 31 uh, he, well Pilate asked what, what is the accusation Pilate said to him verse 31 take him yourself and judge him according to your law so he seems to be disinterested the Jews replies we are not permitted to put anyone to death and it's at this point that Pilate becomes interested in so Pilate becomes interested in Jesus because he thinks the capital punishment is, is possible. He obviously knew about Jesus because this, this Roman cohort had gone to be part of the arrest. Um, but when, it, when he hears that death penalty is a possibility, then he becomes interested. And then the question he asks is, are you the king of the Jews? Um, and then this dialogue we can, you know, kind of perhaps return to, but Pilate says, I'm not a Jew. Your own nation and the chief priests have had to do it, but what have you done? And then Jesus answers this enigmatic thing, my kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. And that's really important. Um, because later on we might want to look, you know, what Jesus' attitude is to this. He's saying his followers are not fighting. Followers are not, not, not fighting. He's not stopping from being handed over. Uh, but as it is, my kingdom is not from here. So that's not the answer that Pilate wants. So he says, so you are a king. Jesus says, you say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to my truth listens to my voice. Um, where have we heard that before? Listens to my voice. Somewhere in the Old Testament. <laughs> well, I mean, in, in uh, The Good Shepherd. Yeah. I, you know, the, the shepherd who enters into the sheepfold, the sheep, what is it, the, the sheep hear my voice, you know, the, the, the voice of the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So, um, this is... That, sorry, isn't it something you also says to the Pharisees at points as well, that they don't hear his voice, don't hear what he's saying? Yes. Yeah. I can't is remember what... He's had no proof to kill him. Why did he just put him in prison for a while? Have a another go later. You know, he's got no proof, has he? No. And the mystery is, as well, uh, that he has him flogged. Mm. Mm. So, I mean, yeah. he just suddenly decides to have him flogged. Um, mm. uh, and why? But, but the nature of the flogging is, is really interesting, of the torture is interesting. He then dresses him up as a king. Crown of thorns, purple robe, hail king of the Jews. Um, and 
making it up, isn't he, as he goes along? I, I it may be, or maybe he is actually really goading the Jews, because um, as Harley said, the Jews want a king. They don't want Jesus to be the king. Mm. But they want a king. Israel wants a king. That's their aspiration. So now he's saying, okay, you want a king? I'll give you a king. And he dresses one up. He's got the opportunity to say to the Jews, yeah, you want a king? No chance. You know, this is a joke. Your idea that you can have a king is, is an absolute joke. So there it is, this humiliated man. You know, there's, have a king. Okay. <laughs> yeah. so do you yeah. think do you think that the last line the one i pointed out is out of a kind of hopelessness yeah. we have no king but the emperor <laughs> Boo -hoo kind of moment or well i think he i think he's tricked them you know he's got them to the point he, he's 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 taken to the point where uh the jews blaspheme you know almost against their will. No. Okay, he's got them to say, we have no king but Caesar. So he's got them to say, you know, God is not our king. Uh, so it feels as if the Jews at the end of this have been tricked and coerced into a blasphemous position. And that's what Pilate is, has managed to do. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. that's, Very that's my... But is, isn't it also that there's a there's a power play going on here as well in terms of, although it looks like he's in charge, a lot of power is is still with the Jewish people. So he it's up to them who's released, and they don't give the answer that he wants. Yeah, so, um, you know they choose Barabbas, who who's a murderer, isn't he? And wasn't he a, a, a terrorist as well? And had, he's a zealot. Yes, but he'd killed a few Roman soldiers and so on. I think along the way um yeah. so he's certainly not the one that that pilot wanted released um and i think there's also no emotional response in this that you didn't do what i wanted you to so this is what i'm going to do to to this guy as an example to you all um, yeah i i mean just just look at verse 6 of 19 uh when the chief priests and the priests saw him, they shouted, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, take him yourself and crucify him. Mm. But they can't. They haven't got the authority to crucify anybody. So again, that's, you know, I mean, he's, he's taking away, he's just pointing out their lack of power. Now the Barabbas thing is, that's really kind of, where's that come in? It just comes in here. Uh, uh, I mean, there's no evidence that that custom ever took place. But, but, mm. but so, what, what, why would Pilate do that? I mean, it's almost as if he's goading them, you know. I mean, to say, uh, Barabbas was a bandit, it says here. Uh, why does he, why does he even try to do that? Um, it's a bit puzzling because. If the Jews he's addressing there are the same Jews who brought him, then why would they suddenly change their mind and say, we'll just do release him rather than Barabbas? It's, it's sort of a little bit... Exactly. I've just noticed it now. I've noticed it before, but it actually... If you're asking the people who brought, brought him to you whether you want him released, yeah. well, of course we don't, because we're desperate for you to deal with him for us. So, yeah. Um, Is it are there two Jewish audiences here? That's what I'm wondering. I, I'm not sure. It's one the people and one the priests. No, I don't think so. Oh, I, no, I, okay. No. I, I mean, I think it's, it's uh, I mean, otherwise that would be, that would have been made clear, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? Mm. He goes out to the Jews again. The Jews yes. are in that mm, okay. Okay. Yes. But but I, I think it's, it's all, it's more of this teasing, you know. Okay, we'll have him back, you know. I, you know, you know, you brought him to me, but yeah, take him back then if you, if, if, if you want, I mean, I can, I can let him free, uh, mm. but you, and so on. So they're tricked again, you know, into, into uh, revealing their powerlessness in the situation, and mm. all of the power 
does in the end lie with, with Pilate. And he says it in verse 10. Pilate therefore says to, them, do you to Jesus, do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and power to crucify you? Um, and Jesus' answer is to completely subvert that. The Jews can't subvert it. The Jews are given a choice, you know, accommodate, submit, or rebel. You know, that, that's the choice that they've got. They can submit to Rome or they can rebel against Rome. Uh, but Jesus is, is offering them a, another way, saying you would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Mm. And then he goes on to make the point that the gospel writer is trying to make, therefore the one who handed me over to you, in other words, the Jews, is guilty of a greater sin. Yeah. So but whether, that, yeah. Sorry, it does read as quite it, it it reads as quite carefully choreographed to put the blame where the writer wants it to be. I think, but but it doesn't. I mean, in a sense, Pilate is guilty of the lesser sin. Now the question is: is is Pilate guilty of the lesser sin because he was a bit nicer to Jesus, which clearly he was not. Mm -hmm. Because uh, he had him flogged, he had him crucified. No. So that's not being nicer. Um, no. the, the, the lesser sin is that he was not a believer. The lesser sin was that he was not someone who believed that God is king. Yeah. The greater that's sin is that those who, who, who were of, I mean, because this is, you know, John's gospel and I came to, came to his own and his own received them not. Yeah. So the greater sin is of his own who, who received him. Because Pilate doesn't get it. Pilate, like Harley said earlier, I mean, Pilate's you know, making it up as he goes along. And so when, you know, Jesus says, you know, um, uh, where is it? Um, uh, he says, you have no power. Where is it? Where um, Pilate says, so well, you are a king. Um, oh, oh so you are a king. It's a bit earlier on is it? Uh, uh, oh, yeah, there we yes, go. Yes, verse, verse yeah. 37 of the 18th century. So it's so like Pilate is trying to cling on to the things that he knows, and it's a very limited view. He hasn't got any spiritual connection with the world that Jesus is talking about. So he kind of seizes on the moment of Jesus saying, you know, I've, I've got power, um, or, you know, there is some power, and that that's the, all he can see. Mm, mm, mm. Absolutely. So what... What, um, yeah, so so you've got this kind of um, then this kind of alternative power. Mm. Uh, verse 11, this, this is Jesus answered him, you would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore the one who handed me over to you is guilty of the greatest sin. So on. So, earlier as well in verse 9, and asked Jesus, where are you from? Well, I mean, what's the answer to that? Mm. Um, so, I mean, what, what, what is Jesus supposed to say? We know in John's Gospel where Jesus is from. Uh, you know, he is God so loved the world that he sent his only son. Mm -hmm. that we know exactly where Jesus is from. Uh, so the power that Jesus, I, I mean, the, the power balance between the Jews and Pilate is, is absolutely clear. The Jews want Pilate to do something for them, mm. but they're, they're supplicants. Please kill this man for us. And Pilate takes the chance to just humiliate them and say and point out how exactly how powerless they are and how ridiculous the idea of Israel having a king in the eyes of Rome is just ridiculous. So that that power clash is just one one nil, you know, one nil to Pilate. But then this other power clash between Jesus and Pilate is completely different because it's it, the the confrontation is between the power that comes from above. And the power that comes from uh, temporal power, you know, from human power, um, and uh, question is whether or not that tells us something about how Jesus ap 
approaches Rome? What 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 is qualitatively different in the approach of Jesus and therefore his subsequent disciples, how they should relate to empire and to overarching hegemonic political power? Mm. If you uh, uh, pause, because if you if you then see all human power as being secondary to the power of God then that deflates human power. It kind of gives us permission. I think I think I would put it this way. It gives us permission as followers of Jesus to confront hegemonic power. In fact, it almost gives you the responsibility to do that, to, to challenge hegemonic power, but in a particular way, yeah. uh, in a particular way, uh, but to challenge hegemonic power uh, because, you know, uh, the requirement of God for justice and for uh, compassion, for peace, you know, for reconciliation, all those things that, you know, we believe to be the qualities that God mm. wants mm. God's, God's kingdom, kingdom is about, then we have a responsibility and therefore... Uh, the power to challenge, the right to challenge hegemonic power, Roman power or, you know, uh, Putin's, Russian's power or America's power or European, you know, colonialism or whatever it is, you've got the right to challenge that because the things of God actually have got a power over those things. But the, the way in which you challenge is key isn't it because yeah. jesus doesn't take it on mm. he allows it to apparently win yeah and then and i just want to go off on a bit of a tangent but take it in full circle as well if i may mm. because um i've been listening this week as the hay festival um you know the the literary festival in in hay on why and there's quite a lot of it that's online and i've been listening into some this week and there was a very interesting session on democracy this afternoon. Uh, Lise Doucette, who's the only British uh, BBC yeah. international uh, journalist, was there and, and a couple of historians and so on. And it made me also think of your sermon on Sunday, Vaughan, in terms of uh, the world mimicking or taking on fake mm -hmm. spirituality um, in that uh, the, the whole idea of democracy is becoming debased because people are taking it on um who aren't democrats that are taking on the appearance of it and least Dissek gave a very specific example of um erdogan in um turkey um who will say he's won the election democratically um and therefore he's a democrat but in every way possible he's undermined democracy and the election was not in any sense fair and she gave a very specific example she said, when uh, you saw on the television in Turkey, the candidates presented and the election forthcoming, you had a picture of Erdogan smiling um, and, and looking at the camera, looking all lovely with his name underneath. And then you had a black box with just the other candidate underneath it. No name, nothing. Um, so you wouldn't know if you weren't particularly literate, the other person's name. Who would you mm -hmm. vote for when you got to the booth? You'd vote for the one whose name you recognized. Mm -hmm. And they know this. And that's not democracy. Right. So how do Christians in Turkey challenge that um, abuse mm. of power, that fake democracy? And the same is true in America. Um, you know, Trump did everything he could to undermine democracy, but make it look like he was a Democrat and still is. You know, he's mm. still at it, isn't he? Um, and it's not by taking it on on its own terms. It's finding a different way of doing it. And, and that's where 
the Holy Spirit comes in, I suppose. Yeah. Not I suppose Absolutely. it is, isn't it? Yeah. But I, I think it, you know, we have this world now with fake uh um a pretense at democracy so that they can no one can attack them. Yeah. Um uh, and, and this, sorry, yeah, sorry. No, no, that's it. I think that's plain yeah. easy. And and I think I mean, just following on from that, in verse the how, how you do it. I mean, in verse 36 of chapter 18, there it reads, My kingdom is not from this world. If my yeah. kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. So he is saying about something qualitatively different. Mm. But the other clue, if I can find it, um, to this is. Uh, here in verse 37, so you are a king, you say that I'm a king, for this I've born, for this I came to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him what is truth. Now, there's no big philosophical debate going on here with Pilate because he doesn't wait to listen to an answer. You know? mm. We're not getting into a Socratic you know, kind of dialogue mm. at this point. Pilate's not interested. But uh, this question, everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. So those two things are the how, I think, that's in this passage. Number one, you don't just fight and you don't use the, the, the conventional methodologies of, of the world, you know, one against the other. Yeah. But what you do is listen to the voice of Jesus and listen to the truth of Jesus. Um, and that is that truth that gives you the freedom. Um to live in an alternative way, to live within the kingdom, to to challenge if need be, uh, you know, the, the 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 powers, or to just you know have the the freedom of 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 your having your integrity, even if you know life is tough, you you still maintain and keep your integrity. Mm. I don't know if that's right or not. Mm. Yeah. Um, I think there's um, there's an issue of terminology throughout all of this, and um, one important thing is that the you know the Roman Empire didn't have kings hmm. at any rate from you know not not since you know sort of way back when we were talking about Rome as a state. But then the Romans overthrew their kings and started a republic. And even until very late on, um, you know, the Rome, you know, the, the, they would talk of em emperors and not of kings, but emperors were not kings. And they, um, uh, and, you know, Augustus um, re apparently refused recognition as a king. So that, um, um uh you know and there still was this pretense of the roman republic so that when um um you know when um uh pilate is asking about the king of the jews um he doesn't mean you know the king in the sense that roman emperors were kings he, he was you know talk, talking about uh you know the, the king in the sense of you know the very early days of um autocratic rule in okay. Rome by 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 kings uh, and um um and and of course you know it 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 was i mean you know the Roman empire was um not 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 exactly a realm of peace and freedom but it wasn't um you know it 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 was um only you know it, it but it also wasn't um a, you know uh, um, a, you know a, a, a monarchy and um you know when um 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 when Pilate is acting are you a king um he's you know asking something very loaded because he he you know for him there weren't any kings anymore yeah. Um, for you know, and certainly the for for the educated Jews, although the Jews had had kings, then the you know, the, the educated Jews would uh, not you know would not refer to Roman em emperors as kings, and it was you know and you know sort of 
you know, you know to sort of talking to talking as uh, you know talking of kings as things as people who had been there way back in the past. Um, mm. But is this is it, Graham? Do you think this is uh, well? I think it's kind of one of two things really. One is that because Jesus talked about the kingdom of God, yes. that, that in a sense that's what the the Jews were objecting to. I mean, they saw this as yeah, blasphemy. Yeah. So, so that's where the, the kingship thing comes important for the, the Jews. But also, is it about the, the way in which the Roman Empire controls regions, you know, uh, regions that they had they had captured, uh, you know, so mm. so they were always trying to find an accommodation with local leadership, but also not allowing yeah. that local leadership to have any national aspirations mm. of their mm. own, which overrode yes. that, that of the, the Roman Empire. Yeah, so you know, what did she do, you know? Udica. I mean, I, I think, I think, I think, I think, that, I think that's very true. Um, and um, you know, I mean, especially in John's Gospel, what what we, um, you know, um, the feeling I get is that well, you know, whenever Jesus is confronting the authorities, um, you know, there's a sort of um, overt text and there's a hidden text. Mm. Um, and you know the overt text is, um, you know, I mean the overt text has to be. I mean, you know, as, as long as you're talking about the sort of things that the you know the priest, the high priest said, uh, mm. the overt text is something that's, um, you know, not actually claiming um, um, kingship or anything like that. And, and and that 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 that's that 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 of course makes the um you know the um um you know makes the Jewish religion potentially very um you know in 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 a very difficult position because uh you know the Hebrew scriptures talk all the time about kings <laughs> yeah. and, uh, mm. so that uh you know when the you know when the uh, leaders of the Jews are talking to the Romans, then, of course, you know, they, they presumably have to be very careful not to say anything that sounds very too monarchical. Yeah. And that, that's why I think that's where, they, in the end, they Pilate manages to trap them into that, that state of sentence, we have no king but the emperor, you know, that, that in the end, yeah. he, gets, he gets them to admit it, that they have no power. Uh, and And, and the, the, the ultimate symbol of the Jewish power is, you know, this man who is just dressed up in a crown of thorns and a purple mm -hmm. robe mm -hmm. and hanging hanging on a cross with a sign saying, "This is the King of the Jews." You know, the, the irony, yeah, yeah. you know, his thing is just just humiliating, humiliating mm -hmm. completely. Um, does it say anything for us in terms of how we, you know, we? We are Christians in a in a very different world, but where empire, as a word, is you know a kind of shorthand for the way in which you know Amazon and the EU and China and you know all these these massive powers uh, which are remote from us you know seem to have power over our lives and mm -hmm. take away control. In in our local, I mean, the amount of power that a, a national government has is is greatly reduced, as we've discovered. You know, I mean, with Brexit, you know, I mean, that was a great idea of breaking away from the big hegemonic, you know, EU, and uh, discovered that it's put us in a vulnerable and weak position. I mean, is there, is there anything we can learn from the way Jesus just stands in front of Pilate? You know, what he says about um, his followers not fighting off and uh, 
listening to the truth and living the truth and having the freedom of being in the truth. I think it's I think it's that the the human power matters if it's used correctly, if it's used properly. But if it's abused, then ultimately, ironically, it loses its power. It will appear to have power. But there, there is a way in which, um, and I'm not being complacent here or high-eyed, I don't think, because it isn't necessarily easy, but there is a way in which God will undermine it. Um, you know, it may not happen straight away, and a lot of people may really suffer. Um, that's a consequence of it, but but in that process, its power will be diminished. Um, and I think... I think people who look to human power and think of it as the ultimate are never satisfied. And there's there's got to be something there. Why are they not satisfied if they've got what they wanted? You know, why is Putin not satisfied? Because he isn't. You know, he's a toddler having a tantrum because he's not got what he wanted. And a lot of people are dying as a result. But his power is gradually being diminished in the process. Um, and uh, the, the, that's not an easy answer because our yeah. tough answer, I think. Um, I think, I think, I think that the past, what the passage does is give a whole perspective on, power, yeah, on, you know, on, on, on great power because you know, Pilate was representing uh, mm. not just himself, but he was a representative of the Roman state, you know, um, at, both in this gospel and that's where he stands in this gospel. Um, also in reality, in historical reality. Um, and yet, somehow or other, this humiliated man, this, yeah. you know, this kind of dressed up in a crown of thorns and a flogged and, you know, with a purple robe on, uh, actually gets the better of it, you know, because the authority that rests on, on that broken man, you know, the authority that rests on him, is greater than the authority that comes from the robe, and and if we have that mindset, if, we, yeah. if that's how, if that's how we look at things, and that's how we view the world, and they're the spectacles that we put on when we look at political power, then that actually changes, gives us a freedom to act, and a freedom to you know listen to the truthful words of Jesus and live them that wouldn't be there. Jesus hadn't stood with his purple robe and his crown of thorns in front of Pilate and said, you have no power over me. Yeah. I think one of the most offensive things that Jesus says to Pilate is, from Pilate's point of view, you would have no power over me unless it had been given to you from above. Implying that it hasn't, you know. And, yeah. and also implying that Pilate is part of the world. You yes. Know? You know, the, the, the Jews are part of the world and he's not of this world. Yes. If Jesus is not part of the Jewish world, uh, of, of the world of those Jews, not all Jews, but those Jews. He's not exactly. part of their world, and he's not part, and Pilate is not part of Jesus' world either. Mm. Mm. We're somewhere else. You know? mm. And you don't have to have that, what the Jewish had was a choice between submission or uh, zealotry. You know? there's, there's somewhere else that you can be in this political mm. world. Uh, any last I words? One, well, I mean, what, one one of the questions this raises is how difficult is it to tell the truth? <laughs> you know, and 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 for um, you know, and telling the truth isn't um, merely a matter of not telling fibs. No, it's you know, it's it has there's a lot of paying attention to your language and paying mm. attention to other people's language. Mm. And um, you know, uh, and also trying to bring about you know a, a kingdom in which people can tell the truth. Yeah, a theme that's been coming out of hay with all the politicians, who are mostly, let's face it, Labour politicians. I don't think there's a Tory there at all, but never mind. Um, but they're they're saying they're trying to revive the idea of politicians as teachers, 
as people who lead in that way in how they teach society. And I think, Graham, if you're a teacher, then you help people discover the truth mm. for themselves. Mm. And maybe that's mm. how we tell the truth. Yes, yes. Which sounds like a segue into <laughs> next week's session, which is uh, Graham and uh, St. Augustine and the teacher. <laughs> well, <Wow. Yeah. laughs> <There you go. laughs> on a plate. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah, it's lovely. That's been great. I mean, uh, thanks very much. Yeah, thanks, yeah. Vaughan. Thanks, everybody. It's been really good. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Take care. See you next week. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.